motherhood or parenthood as like a path, almost like as a, a path to awakening, right, is a more intense path than any kind of sitting on a mountaintop alone would be because all your stuff is shown to you. Hi, and welcome to Yoga Stories Project. Each session, I talk with yogis about their life and practice. I do this to inspire and empower you to bring yoga and mindfulness into your life. Who am I? I'm Hunter Clark Fields, Mindfulness Mama Mentor. I coach smart, accomplished, overstressed moms on how to cultivate mindfulness in their daily lives. I've been practicing yoga and mindfulness for over 20 years and have taught thousands of women worldwide. Hey there, thanks for listening to the podcast today. I'm so grateful for your ears. This is episode 38, and it's a bit of a strange one. The tables are turned today, and the interviewer is the interviewee. My good friend Gwen Sofer has agreed to interview me, and you get to hear my yoga story today. I have no new reviews in iTunes. Wah, wah, wah. If you haven't given me a review in iTunes yet, please, please go do so. It helps spread the word on the podcast and helps it reach more ears as we want to grow and spread these ideas about conscious living as far as we can. So support this podcast by going and leaving a review and of course, share it with your friends. Let people know that it's a good listen as long as you enjoy it, of course. And uh, today's podcast is sponsored by Present Mama Community. This is my online community where you get yoga practices that can fit into your day, guided meditations, mindful parenting practices. But the real huge value of Present Mama Community is that we do multiple coaching calls a month now. And so that means I get on the phone a couple times a month with the members and we get you get guidance, you get support, you get that loving accountability that you need to really make these mindfulness practices stick in your life because that is why I created this. I said, people ask me, how do I continue? How do I keep going? And so I created Present Mama Community to help keep going with your practices to help you become more present. So go ahead and go to presentmamacommunity.com. And now on to this Tables Are Turned episode. Thanks so much for listening. So hi, everybody. My name is Gwen Soffer, and I'm here today interviewing the interviewer, (laughs) Hunter Clark Fields. And um, I'm happy to be here, and I'm glad to be on this side of the seat and learned a little bit more about Hunter and um, her inspiration for what she does. So thank you for inviting me. And for being thank you here. for interviewing me. <laughs> right. It's so funny. I actually I feel kind of nervous. <laughs> it's like, I'm on the other right. side now. Oh my god. <laughs> so I know you interview people from all over the country about um, their experience with yoga and what yoga's meant to them. So I wanted to start off by asking you how you started in yoga. How did you find yoga? Oh, um, I, I went to my first yoga class when I was 17 with my mom and she, she introduced me to yoga. She took me to this Ashtanga class. And for me as this like bendy flexy person, um, it, you know, I was immediately like, you know, quote unquote good at it. You know, (laughs) I was able to do some of those like yoga party tricks kind of moves. And so it was fun and I enjoyed it. So then I tried it at college and um, and that's kind of where I got into more of the, I guess, a little bit more into the spiritual experience of yoga. Like the there was the bliss feeling after the class. But like for me, I had been um, I had been raised agnostic, and so I was raised without any kind of religion. And so when I was young, any kind of like spiritual experience I found, I found in, in, na- in nature, near the ocean or in the woods or in the fields was where I, I got that just, um, awe and that intensity of mm. like feeling, um, I guess like a very, a very mind body connected experience where my body felt this feeling. And then it was that, it's that feeling like, you know, that, that you kind of like, it's, 
It's almost like when love feels so sad because it's like, you know, it's, you're going to, it's not going to last. You're going to lose it, but it's this such intense, beautiful feeling. So though, when I found that feeling as a kid, I found that in, in nature. And then what was cool for me is so when I started getting into <clears throat> in college, I was running and I was running in nature and I went to these yoga classes and I found some of that some of that same feeling like in my body, you know, and in this experience of the sensations and things in my body. And it was like, it just felt so right, you know? And so I I was, I was hooked, I guess. (laughs) It's so interesting what you say about the nature, because I've heard people say before that when we lived in a society where we had more connection to nature and there was sort of a built in system for that experience that you're describing Mm -hmm. and then becoming industrialized or moving into cities or whatever and not having access to that as much as part of our daily life um that that may be why people are seeking Mm -hmm. yoga and meditation and all those things so much now because there's not that automatic connection yeah that we used to have yeah that's so i think that's interesting Yeah, yeah yeah i mean i could see that because we're like pulled away from our bodies even so much, you know, it's like Mm -hmm. not even just nature. I mean, but I mean, you know, our bodies are a part of nature, right? We are an experience of, of the natural world as animals, conscious animals in this, in this world. But like, and now not even, I mean, for the, in the industrial age, we've been pulled out of nature, but now we're even just pulled out of our bodies. Like we're just in a, in a, in a virtual experience in in a lot of ways, you know, and seated and, um, or or sh- encouraged to ignore that side of ourselves. Yeah, for sure. Right. And then also the sort of lack of ritual, I think, too, is another mm. aspect that, you know, no matter how you practice yoga, um, there's a, a bit of a ritual connected to it. Absolutely. And, yeah, so the, yeah. and that that's kind of a, a base human connection that many people don't have in their lives on a regular basis basis anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, that's yeah. really cool. I love what you're bringing up because, I mean, you can go to a, <clears throat> a yoga class in like a in a gym mm-hmm. and and wherever like a and and it's still got this ritual aspect of like we're doing. I mean, a sun salutation is a prestration, mm-hmm. you know. And, and so it, even though it's it's pulled away from that spiritual aspect in a lot of ways, like. You're, it, you know, it has these components of hands to heart, of bowing down, mm-hmm. and then of that settling in afterwards. I, I let, that's a really interesting, I mean, no wonder we, we want that want so that, much, right? right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And maybe there were more ways to express that. And now we have fewer options, but yoga seems to pull us in that way on some level. So how did you, so um, how did you move from practicing yoga to wanting to be a teacher how did that happen (laughs) well I loved yoga so much and I was like this um you know struggling student and I was trying to pay my way through college and uh figure out what I wanted to do with my life and I uh I tried a lot of different things and so basically I I just wanted to I wanted to go to free yoga class oh (laughs) That's always a good reason. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, if I become a yoga teacher, I can take all the yoga classes I want, which is like a really crappy reason to become a yoga <laughs> teacher, actually, because you end up like not having, not being able to go to all the classes you want. That's true. So right. <laughs> it's like such a like bait and switch we get into. But anyway, um, that's kind of why I did it. And I was actually in a place after um, graduate school where... I was a teacher. I was. I had gone to um, Massachusetts College of Art, and I studied painting, and I studied teaching. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have a real job. I'm going to have like a solid, steady life and a real teaching job, and then I'll be able to make art. And the, as that's a really terrible reason going to teaching, actually, as you probably know, because teaching is so all encompassing. And I went into this teaching this school that was it was um, it was funny because at the same time I'd gotten my first professional art show, and then I went into teaching at the school, and I was 
it was a tough school. Like it's a tough school in Delaware. Like a lot, it's, it, there's just a, there were a lot of fights. I was the only art teacher for like 1200 plus kids. Oh my goodness. And, and I was a really sensitive person. Like I hadn't at this point started any meditation practice and I was really, um, I, I kind of went through like highs and lows pretty regularly. I would kind of dip down into these highs and lows and it was like too much for me. I couldn't, I just felt like it was killing my soul. Like it was mm. so hard for me to absorb being on the side, having people hate me just because of the position that I was in, you know? Yeah. And I had, I had <clears throat> like the great kids that I loved and that like the art kids who like ate lunch in the art room and they're awesome. And actually I'm like still Facebook friends with some of them. It's really funny. But, um, but I, I needed like a big change. So I thought I'm going to go do this yoga teacher training. And it, it was, it was, I, I, I left my job there after two years and I, I went and did a month long immersive yoga teacher training mm. and it was, um, awesome. It was really great. <laughs> it was transformative. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the middle of our training here and I think people don't understand until they're in the midst of a teacher training that it's more than just learning how to teach yoga. You learn a lot about yeah. yourself during yeah. it. You know, Absolutely. there's something about learning how to be a teacher that that happens. Um, so how would you say that your yoga practice has changed the most since you started when you were uh, a yeah. teenager? Yeah. <laughs> I'm imagining greatly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has changed a lot. Um, I'm still really drawn to a vigorous vinyasa practice. That's because I had tend to have a... Um, I tend to have a lot of like physical energy that I call it my yayas. Like I have to get my yayas out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. So that's why I run. I need to like get that energy out. And um, so I really love that. But I, I really love restorative yoga too. It's something that restorative yoga is kind of something that I don't practice as much as I would like to. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, I, I, so I still like that kind of vigorous practice. I think um, my yoga has changed from understanding more of like the physical side of yoga and the movement and the body mechanics kind mm -hmm. of thing. And I've gone through a lot of understanding of that and learning about that. But I, as I started my, when I started my teacher training, I came home and that was when I was able to start my own mindfulness meditation practice like when I got home I was like okay I'm finally gonna do this <laughs> I've been reading about it for 10 years and now I'm gonna finally um have my own meditation practice which as you know is part of the larger yoga um sort of system of mm -hmm. enlightenment yeah. <laughs> and and so my yoga has become I don't know. It's become much more, uh, on one hand, it's become much more like about meditation and mindfulness. On the other hand, my yoga physical asana practice has become much um, smaller in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Like I go to, like I just enjoyed, I just enjoyed Gwen's amazing class. Oh. Really nice. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> but, um, but it's like every morning I do 15 minutes of yoga. Mm -hmm. And I do that every morning and it, it starts my day and I feel good and it opens up my body and it gives me energy. And, it, and so like the physical practice has become um, s smaller, but more like a very steady, meaningful. To, yeah, meaningful. Like to, yeah, this yeah. I think that's the, the hardest thing to um, try to convince people of is that you don't always have to do yoga in an hour and a half class in a studio or a gym or even on your mat or in any special clothing you can be 15 minutes five minutes yeah. um and you know that it, it's more simple than i think what we build it up to be sometimes yeah <laughs> so. yeah and it can it can it can have big effects in small ways that way you know yes. like i think that yeah people think like i have to fit in I don't know, like at least like 50 minutes of yoga. I'm not, or I'm not doing anything. And, right. And it's amazing. Um, I, my friend, um, Carla Nomberg just said that I was the one who taught her to, to, that you can do yoga in five minutes and how to do yoga in five minutes. And, and we've talked about this and it's like, 
five minutes of yoga can shift your yourself right out of that fight or flight reaction yes. and right into that rest and response reaction where you can greet your day with more presence and more ease. Mm-hmm. And it can, it's just that you taking that moment of checking in and that moment of releasing physically, whatever needs to be released. It's um, yeah. It doesn't have to be big. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th- and also touching on what you said that, our yoga isn't just the physical posture on the mat. It's, it's everything we're doing during the day. So it's, you know, I often think of, um, you mentioned how when you become a yoga teacher, you actually sometimes practice yoga less frequently because you're yeah. so busy teaching yeah. yoga and on the physical aspect of that. But I don't think of my yoga teaching as separate from my yoga practice because I feel like I still have to show up in that mm-hmm. way, mm-hmm. that presence and that, you know, um, connection, teaching yoga in the same way if as I were practicing it. And we'd like to put everything in its nice little box and say, like, this is my yoga and this is how I parent my kids and this is what I do. But if you're thinking mm-hmm. of yoga in the bigger picture, all aspects of your day are part of your yoga practice. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, ahimsa is non non-harming right or like or, or treating everything as as with as much kindness as you can including yourself and i mean all those aspects of yoga and, and just focus or or your even your dharma your path yes. i mean like and, and teaching is so much like a, a service right it's yeah. like a, you know when you say namaste it's like i'm i see the light the the divine the true you like that's Mm -hmm. a powerful thing to say right and to to um just take it to that level in a you know in this way we connect and move together as a community is is really special and it takes yeah it takes bringing that practice into all of your yeah so along those lines how do you think your getting into yoga in the way that you did and practicing the physical postures and committing to mindfulness. How do you feel like that has affected your personal life the most? That's a good question. It's funny because I ask other people that. (laughs) Now I'm totally stuck. No. uh, Yeah. um, I think it's made me, it's made me realize that A, when I take care of myself, I'm just, then I can be there for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And when I take care of myself with yoga, asanas, postures, I am opening up these stuck areas of my body. I am realigning my spine. I am um, strengthening my body. I'm strengthening my lungs, my opening my heart. I'm doing all these things. I'm releasing, um, stress. I'm getting blood flow to the brain. So I'm, it's like this all encompassing kind of, it's like, it's like a tune up, right? Mm-hmm. Like a little, yeah. it's like kind of this it's a realignment, this, yeah, right? this like mind body tune up that we go through. Right. And, um, and so as I practice that and I, and when I'm taking care of myself when I'm (laughs) well-tuned, to use that metaphor, is that then I'm not, I'm not grouchy with my kids. I can, I can put my stuff aside and pay attention Mm. to my husband, to my, to my kids, to my responsibilities. I'm not, I've kind of, I've gotten those yayas out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I've, I've released like a lot of and in the, the meditation, I've released a lot of any anxiety or, you know, mental formations that were kind of holding me back. So I, it's like it's like it clears the slate so I can, the, it, to use another metaphor, like if, if there was mud in a pond, like all that, that mud is, that might have been stirred up and just stayed stirred up is kind of settled down so I can just be clear and open for mm-hmm. what life is bringing me. And so then it's it's easier and, and it's better for them. They're yeah. much happier. <laughs> yeah. Right. They'll say, go to yoga, go to yeah, yoga. Exactly. Like, <laughs> my, and my daughter, Sora, she's five now. And she says like, I was like, and it said something grumpy to her or something. She's like, mommy, did you meditate today? Oh my goodness. <laughs> like, oh, that's funny. Well, you know, I think to people, it's very easy to kind of think that 
yoga makes the bad things go away oh, yeah. mm -hmm. when it's really, I, I think at least in my experience, and it sounds like in your experience as well, that um, it really, it doesn't make the conflicts that we deal with and the struggles we have go away, but it lets us approach them in a way that's really clear and available and um, understanding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, and we can, you know, without, if, if we've taken care of all our baggage, you know, to some degree, then we can respond and recover better. And it, and, and it, it's interesting. I was thinking about this, like parenting or, or really everything we do, but parenting is basically how we respond to our kids in any given moment. Right. Mm -hmm. But that response is both like our, our external response, like how, what the words I'm saying and the communication I'm using, but it's also this internal response. And it, it's the same sort of with the rest of the world. And so when we can take, you know, then we, when, when we can tune ourselves up and, and, and take care of ourselves mindfully so that we can, you know, then we can respond our internal response isn't so heavy and strong, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, it kind of just turns down the volume on yeah. that, that, you know, those in, intense responses that I had as a young person I had was, you know, I couldn't, my emotional responses were so intense and strong to life that that's all I could deal with. And, and then, so my external response just was like that stuff kind of just bursting yeah, out, very reactive, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so, I don't know. It's just like uh, then that as we turn that internal response can be more with more a little more equanimity. We can kind of absorb some of the the challenges and the difficulties and also recover from them. Yeah, better. does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And mm -hmm. I think um, you know I I don't have small children any longer, but I do. When you send out your newsletter, I look at it and I think I um, that your newsletter around your work with moms and, mm -hmm. and mindfulness and motherhood um, that I didn't discover yoga till my kids were older and I or mindfulness or anything and was very reactive. And um, I think what a, what an amazing skill to give young moms and that part of motherhood in our culture, I think is a lot around um, martyrdom. Like, you yeah, know, like I have to totally. do it all and I can only, I have to be this way all the time. And, um, the expectation and as beautiful as motherhood is, it's incredibly difficult and challenging and really pushes you to your edges. Oh my God, yeah. Um, so to have a skill base or an understanding like those, those reactions are normal. They're, mm -hmm. un, they're stress reactions, but then you have this managing system that you might be available to you through, mindfulness or yoga that can help you negotiate yeah. the stress. Yeah. You know, yeah. So I think it's amazing what you do. Can you tell, so talk a little bit more about that with your work? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, and I think you're right. I mean, I guess for me, um, like motherhood was the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. I think it really hit me really hard. I was, I, like I said, I was this really sensitive person. Like I had these really deep highs and lows, and when, like, finally around, I think I was, it was 10 years ago, I was 27 when I started meditating. And then just like a year or two later, I got pregnant for the first time. And it was amazing. Like with them, when I finally started meditating, I looked back over after doing it for a few months and realized, I thought first, I, at first I thought this is like a little tangent, but I th thought that nothing was happening. Mm -hmm. at, at first, I thought I was just kind of sitting down and thinking for 10 minutes. <laughs> like, what's the point of this? This is really <laughs> <Right>. like useless. <laughs> and then I realized that I hadn't had any of these deep lows. Like I would fall into a pit of despair at a regular basis mm -hmm. for all for all of my life up until then. And then I didn't, it didn't happen for those two or three months. And I was like, wow. Oh, mm. holy, this is yeah. amazing. And the amazing part is it really hasn't happened since then. And I had 27 years of my life where I would have every few weeks, mm. I would just be crying for some reason because I just felt life so intensely. Mm -hmm. And then like motherhood hit me and I was like, <gasps> boom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I felt like, and that first year was really hard. And I, I lost my meditation practice for the walk, as you do, because you're not getting enough sleep and all that stuff. And I, but I realized 
I could feel those lows and, and that anxiety. I could feel that coming back. So I made sure I brought that back into my life. But then when my daughter started walking and talking, I mean, I felt like, like I was just this, like in some ways when she started saying, I mean, it, it sounds so stupid. It's like saying no and all this stuff, but like, I, I was like this big, raw trigger waiting to be pulled. Like I would just get so yeah. when she got upset, I would be so triggered by her getting upset. Like I would get so upset and I realized, whoa, whole, I'm doing exactly like what my, what happened to my family. Like mm. my dad had this rage and, and he would get really upset if I, you know, if, if, if I got upset and I had, and I realize I have this rage in me, I have this mm. really intense temper and I was really like disappointed in myself and I was really like sad and it was really hard. I mean, it was just, I, I couldn't understand how I could like yell or scream at this like small child. And she, but she was so intense. Like it was like this, we, she was like exactly as I was. And so so it was like you were yelling at yourself. It was so hard, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't. And she would, she would have like three temper tantrums a day during certain periods. Like it was really intense. And, um, and really hard. And it's so funny because I think about this work that I do now and, um, when my daughter was a toddler, no one would have ever guessed that I would be teaching anything to do with parenting. Cause I would just like drop her off at her school and then I would like burst into tears oh. <laughs> because it was so challenging and it didn't. Yeah. And I think because it was so, it was such a hard, I mean, I just, I guess I don't know. We look in our culture at motherhood or parenthood, like, like we look at its funny aspects. We look at its, you know, in heartwarming aspects and, you know, we want to focus on those, but the reality is it's so hard. Like for people who aren't taught how to take care of their difficult feelings, like, which is like, I don't know what, 95% of us. Right. <laughs> it's like it, it, it was it can it can bring up so much and I feel like in a lot of ways motherhood or parenthood as like a path almost like as a a path to awakening right is a more intense path than any kind of sitting on a mountaintop alone would be because all your stuff is shown to you mm-hmm. in a really intense way in a really meaningful relationship and 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 in your in my mind at least at that point I was failing at it and I was a kid who, a person who was like kind of an achiever. I got the good grades. I did all this stuff and I was failing at this and I really sucked at it. And I just, I couldn't do this to my daughter and I couldn't do this. And I just, like, it was the most important work that I had to do in my life was to take control of my temper, to learn how to take this mindfulness that I was practicing and bring it into those daily moments and to, to learn how to do this better and Mm -hmm. and to communicate better. I mean, it was just the most important thing I could ever do. And, and so that's, I don't know, that's why I do the work that I do. I'm coaching moms who are overwhelmed, frustrated, like, you know, maybe smart, accomplished people, but who are stressed and overwhelmed, like, that how to get to a let's create um, some kind of mindfulness practice that you can stick with even if it's really small some kind of self-care mindfulness practice and then I teach them b um like here are ways to communicate that are respectful and honest and that aren't gonna like trigger your kid and trigger you you know so so just this learning that I've done it just it I feel like it all and then I and then I share, like here we can create a yoga practice and things like that. But um, I don't know. I feel like we have these patterns, right, that come through generations. And I'm not blaming my parents or anything like that or their parents. I just feel like there's suffering that there's certain types of suffering that are passed down through generations. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, yeah, and and if we can transform our own suffering in this crucible of parenthood, mm-hmm. 
what a gift. Like that's right. a transform generations, right? right? Totally. That's I think that's so important. And I, I, I mean, I always feel like to there's so much um, guilt and shame around the the journey in motherhood. Like the, you know, there's so many times that we feel like we're failing or, you know, someone blames a mom, you know, like, oh, if you were a better mom, this wouldn't happen. You hear that kind of stuff yeah, yeah. all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we internalize that either through a cult on a cultural level or whatever happened in maybe our particular family. Mm-hmm. Um, and I always think it's like, there aren't bad parents, but there are people that don't have the skills or don't know that the skills even exist to do things differently. Yeah. And, exactly. and mm-hmm. that there's so little available. So I think what you do is so important for people to understand one, we're all capable of yelling at our kids or, or responding in a way that later we regret um, mm-hmm. or pulling up something from our past that has nothing to do even with the situation and that that's normal behavior, but that we also have, we're also intelligent beings that can create a different way of doing something if we have the right tools. Yeah, and that seems yeah. like what you're. Yeah, offering. we can create change, right? Yeah, like it's yeah. possible. There's tried and true methods. Yeah, and, and sometimes we just need support. Like sometimes we just need help to do that. Like that's the thing about a mindfulness practice is that it's hard to do. It's like yeah. so simple, but it's so hard to to bring into our lives, especially if. The structures of our lives don't support that. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, that's that's what I want to do is give people the support, sometimes the accountability um, and, and the, like, strategies and tools that yeah. they need to do that. Mm-hmm. And to know that they're not alone, that that's, oh, yeah. there's, all moms have experienced that at some point on some level, no matter, you know, how easy or difficult parenthood came to you. Um, and I keep saying motherhood, but of course it, it, it's yeah, yeah. to, it's to any parent. Um, and you're also dealing with this, these little people that are your most cherished <laughs> loved ones too. So it's, there's so much, um, invested in that relationship that yeah, it's really yeah. intense. And it, it's it's hard to kind of make a choice, I think, as mothers to kind of like do this work for ourselves. Like we're not taught that when we're when we take care of ourselves, we're we're better mothers. We're taught like no, take sacrifice your, it sacri- all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be a good mother, you have to sacrifice. Mm-hmm. You're not you don't have any time for yourself because you're, you know, I don't know, yeah. like making cookies or like not making cookies like sign of taking care of sick whatever. kids yeah, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I know I used mm-hmm. to do that as a young mom. I used to um I'd get so upset like if my husband would come home from work and be like, you know, want to go work out or something and and even if he would come home and say like, oh, here, I'll take care of the kids. You go do this. I'd be like, no, no, no. You know, like there was almost like this martyrdom that yeah. went along with it that uh-huh. that was imposed through our society. But also I, I perpetuated it through my own mm-hmm. like falling into that pattern of not taking care of ourselves. You know, and I, yeah. I think that I see that a lot in a lot of people when they have young kids. Yeah. So yeah. it's great that you can offer this resource. It sounds like it's really a resource for people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm hoping. And um, yeah, I'm, it, it's interesting. I, I have like some different directions I want to take it that I'm pretty excited yeah. about. But um, And I guess it'll yeah. grow with you. Like as your kids become teenagers. Or, you know, <laughs> we'll like, I, know. <laughs> I know. Mindfulness with teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> The challenge continues. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I have an intense kid, so um, so it, it, I'm sure the yeah. challenge will continue. But, but it, it has helped. Like, things are so, we have so much more ease now. Yeah. Which is really cool. That's great. Yeah. So to your other, so you do this work with the mindfulness and around parenting. And then, of course, you do these incredible interviews that have really grown um, it's been nice to see like the different people you're bringing in so many interesting people. So I wanted to ask you, um, how you, how did you take that turn where you started to create these podcasts? What was, well, it's intimately connected with this studio, Gwen, because I was, um, driving, <laughs> I was driving to teach here at Enso Yoga in Media PA that, and I was driving to teach here and I thought, 
I had just gotten into podcasts and I was listening to some podcasts and I thought I would look up yoga and all I could find was were yoga classes. And I didn't want to like listen to a yoga class. I wanted to listen to people talk about yoga mm-hmm. and how it affected people's lives. So I was like, well, I'll just make it if it doesn't exist, you know, <laughs> like I'll just yeah. make it. And it's funny because I was like very, uh, I mean, there's way better ways one could have like launched and done and I could have learned about it, I suppose, if I, before I did it. But it was kind of nice to start before I was really ready and just kind of make it happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I did that. And um, I just started asking people, will you tell me your, your your story just like yours? I wish I knew what episode it was off the top of my head. Oh. So I could send you <laughs> Look up Gwen Sofer's <laughs> yoga story. It's really good. <laughs> yeah. So did you, um, and then I know your husband know, has some of the technology yeah, yeah. thing. And, like yeah, like, so that's good. That's always like a challenge. He's but, like my ace in the back pocket. Oh. You're like he's like, he, Bill made my music and he's, he has been like my website designer yeah. and he's been like amazing. So William Fields for amazing yeah, music. Yeah, yeah. And it's very it. professionally done. It's really great. So, um, but that's nice to have that component yeah, taken totally. care of too. So, yeah. so would, what would you say? I know you've interviewed viewed many amazing people and and I and there you probably think of each of them individually but what interview really stands out to you I don't know I mean that's a good question there's there's some snippets of interviews that that stand out for me um I really loved um when I talked to Brian Leaf who's the author of um of uh it's like a misadventures of a garden state yogi and another book. They're, they're these hilarious books about yoga. And the second one is about yoga and parenting. And he, he's hilarious. And we had this conversation about, I'm thinking about it now because the snow is coming, but what, what, what would the Dalai Lama do if he was like stuck at home for three snow days with the kids? <laughs> And then we've talked about what would just how mindful would you be then? Exactly. Yeah, he kind of felt like like by the third day, like the Dalai Lama would be kind of pretty grumpy, you know. And, yeah. and but he would be okay with being grumpy. He would just like accept that he was grumpy. Right. And Makes sense. Himself, right? Yeah. And um and it was it was amazing talking to Sean Corn. I she's kind of a, a um. I'm so inspired by her that it was really uh, inspiring to like just be able to talk to her personally. Mm-hmm. And then I really loved um, talking to um, Melody Moore about um, yoga and body image. I think that was really important because I think that's a really important issue in the yoga community. Um, yeah, for sure. And, uh, and I guess some of the other ones that come to mind are things that like issues that are important in the yoga community, like talking to, um, talking to, um, Mike, uh, about from transformation oh, yoga yeah. project Mike Huggins Mike yeah. Huggins about he shared his story for the first oh, time I'm, on yeah. yoga stories project. And it was so powerful. Like I yeah. was, I mean, it was such an intense story that I, it's just like, wow, it's really made me amazed and and i'm trying to sort of work with his organization in delaware now and um and it was interesting it was really cool talking to jacoby myers because ballard sorry jacoby ballard um, can you tell him terrible names? well you're thinking uh, nikki myers yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> jacoby ballard because i needed like more understanding at the point in my mm-hmm. life about transgender you know people and like it was cool to like just be able to ask some questions, you know? Yeah. So, so I, it, I don't know. I feel like it's this big education for me each time. It's this privilege and this, it, you know, to, to get, I don't know. I just really enjoy it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's neat the scope of people that you have because yoga can be experienced in so many different ways and it looks different in so many ways. And then now there's this, um, really interesting turn in yoga towards sort of, you know, equality and social justice and mm. things like that, which mm-hmm. you've tapped into. Um, it's kind of a microcosm of our bigger world is happening in yeah. yoga. And then yeah. to hear people that are leaders in those areas give their perspective is is great. And I think it enhances what, you know, our perception of what yoga is. It makes it a broader experience yeah uh, yeah yeah. I want people to understand how broad it is I guess that's kind of like my overarching um 
mwahaha, like yeah. I'm maniacal yes. plot. <laughs> it's like it all mapped out, right? To, you know, just get so. that big vision of what what is yoga and what does it mean to people, and, yeah. and just kind of get like to it's so much more than what people think it is, I guess. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I thought maybe you'd put this out sort of like a call out to the universe. What would your dream interview be? Oh, my God. That's a good <laughs> question. Oh, wow. Um, so Gwen has not prepped me on this question at all. Um, I would really love to talk to um, Anna Forrest because I um, one of the first – my – teacher who's going to be on the podcast soon, uh, Vidya Heisel, was a student of hers. So I learned a lot of forest yoga in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I would I would love to talk to Anna Forrest. Um, I would like to talk to I would like to talk to Ram Das. That would be very mm. cool. And hear his story now, and I've watched their, his movie, and I think that I that would be really wonderful. So I would love to talk to those two for sure. I'm trying to think of anyone else. There's all kinds of people I'd love, and then there's all kinds of people who like aren't really necessarily big yoga figures that yeah. I'd like to talk to that are, but pr who practice yoga. Um, I want to talk to Krista Tippett, who does On Being. And she has her own yoga practice. I know this because she's talked about it in oh, her on her yeah. radio show and podcast. And I would love. She just seems like such an amazing leader. And I I would love to talk to some of the amazing leaders in, in sort of the mindfulness community. Oh, you know who I really want to talk to? Um, um, Tara Brock. She mm -hmm. has a really great yoga story, which would be fun to share. And I just love her teaching and her, she has incredibly powerful Dharma talks on, on her podcast, which mm -hmm. is, you should just look up Tara Brock. Um, yeah, I would love to talk oh. to her. So, so okay, I'm you putting it out to the universe. So now you know what your work is, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you go. said it out loud. Yeah. <laughs> so, here we go. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your <laughs> side of the story. And, um, you know, it's it, we, it's always nice to see what inspires people to do the work that they do. So Yeah, yeah. It's like a peek yeah. behind the scenes, yeah, everybody. Exactly. Like pulling back the curtain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. So Gwen. you're welcome. You're welcome. And thank you for interviewing me. You're such a, you're like a beautiful person. Oh, and you're thank a good you. friend. And I just, I love like... You know, I've always, I've been inspired. I love having people around me who are always inspired to learn and grow and to like keep pushing the boundaries and, and you do that. And I think that's awesome. Oh, well, I love thank that. you. Thank you. And, and I feel very fortunate to, to know you also and, and have you here as a teacher and, and then see you grow in this way. So I'm proud of you and I'm glad you're, <laughs> you know, finding your way here. Um, Yay. Yeah, and getting the word out there. It's good stuff. <laughs> All right, awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode, Tables Are Turned episode. Please go check out our sponsor, presentmamacommunity.com. Get in on those multiple coaching calls we do a month. And um, please support this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. It's kind of a pain, you know, you have to go to iTunes and sign in and write a review, but it really supports the podcast a lot. And I appreciate it so much. And I give you my big heartfelt thanks. So if you like this podcast, support it by leaving a review and share it with your friends and have a lovely, lovely rest of your day, my friend. Music and technical assistance has been by William Fields. Listen to more of his music at williamfields.com. To subscribe to this podcast and get it delivered right to your inbox, sign up at hunteryoga.com. Thanks again. Have a great week. Namaste.